What's up, Gloomers? So we have it, the final starter guide for Frosthaven. I know I put off doing the Geminit for a while, but you know, it's a high complexity bug being thing. <laughs> Uh, but it is pretty cool. Thanks, patrons, for voting for this. I know it was heavily requested, and I did finally get around to doing it. But I don't think it's ultimately that difficult to play. Um, I know there's a lot of things that you have to do to juggle with it. But ultimately, once you kind of get the tempo, I don't think it's that bad. And um, the dynamic of the different like play styles can be appealing to many characters. Also, the aesthetic of like shape-shifting is one I'm obviously quite fond of. So if I don't think it's that difficult, what's the deal then? Well, we'll dig into it. I'll tell you a few builds, build ideas that I've come up with. If you want more Gloomhaven Frosthaven guides, we'll be bombarding you with a bunch of Gloomhaven 2nd Edition guides starting next year, and obviously we'll be finishing off the Frosthaven stuff as well. So if you like those, be sure to subscribe, and if you want to support us, be sure to like, and uh, also join Patreon. And we have a Discord. Patreon gives you access to, like, early access to guides and stuff and discords we sometimes talk about gloomhaven it's mostly shit posting but it's cool uh the geminate is a medium health gigantic hand size or like small two hand sizes hands size yeah it's the whole point is is you have a lot of cards to work with is really what it comes down to and normally i kind of just like brush over that a little bit to talk a little bit about like why they might have like a certain hand size like the blink blade has a hand size of 10 but it's fairly contingent on you playing some losses for cool effects or persistent effects so it kind of plays more like a nine but the geminit the geminit we're going to talk about the hand size a bit because it really affects how you play entirely so seven and seven and these numbers seem pretty small until you realize like you could play three plays in one hand, three plays in the other hand, and then assuming no losses, which is not the optimal play, you're down to 13 cards uh, left after uh, starting the seventh or eighth round if you long rested. That's just too much stamina. With two hands, you have a lot of room to like burn cards. Not only that, but um, let's say that there's a particularly annoying attack that's going to land and you just revealed it just got revealed and you're like hey i can bail you out move forward and like you can like burn a card to lose it for uh to take a hit because you have enough cards that it's not that big a deal not only that but your loss effects although are still pretty cool are not really like ahead of the curve of like other classes like some classes have really powerful loss effects it's not really that big a deal for you to lose a card so you almost want to build that into your strategy that you can bail people out on like on the fly just being able to lose cards more regularly not only that, but you have a lot of versatility because you have a lot of variety of actions, and some of some of the like minimal like hard control, hard crowd control we get in Frosthaven comes at the hands of the Geminids. So, um, being able to effectively bail out your allies with your high hand size, your high versatility, and being able to bring whatever it is that needs to be done, you have a lot of that. Now you don't have everything. Like, hi, I have a bunch of cards, and they can do everything. You can't. And obviously, uh, the, the toolkit is narrowed into these two forms. So I'm going to go over the two forms for a second. But you have, effectively, the melee form, where uh, a lot of your melee attacks come in. But you'll have other effects. Like, there's a lot more of the the upfront like status effects. You'll get more um, like stuns and disarms. There's a non-lost disarm at level 1 on this form. And you have, like, retaliate. And you'll often be able to poison enemies in this form as well. This is just a really good way to just bring enemies down and punch them. Um, you have, of course have the range form, which obviously has ranged attacks, which is its own benefit, but it has a little bit more of like healing and other stuff. Definitely has some jump stuff too. It's some, there's, there's some good stuff in the form as well as, uh, the ability to punch out stuff and as well as, uh, there's a lot of move, forced movement and pushes and pulls as well into my embrace being one of my favorite of the cards in the range form. But some of the parts in the range form are a little bit particular, specifically precision range. And I'm going to talk about that. Like you have to have very precise range on some cards now um the, the thing is some people will be like hey i have this bow that says plus one range when i use it, it doesn't do anything if it says that you must only target enemies at range three or four you can only target enemies range three or four this goes for anything that has an attack pattern like firefly swarm this you could drop this this little pattern in, within range three or four but like, let's say that you put it in range three and pull it a little close to you, and now one enemy within range is in range two. 
even though you can put the pattern atop them, you can still only target the enemies that are ranged three or four away. It's very specific, so there is no benefit to increasing or downside to decreasing range, as they can only target things at that range. Now, some people find this frustrating, and that's understandable, but um, in general, I'd like to point out that there's a little bit more, I don't know, reliant on the fact that your ranged form must shoot things at range. But you do have other abilities that you can do if, like, you get immobilized or whatnot. So you've got, like, healing and other effects. So um, it's all is not lost in these scenarios. Plus, I think the ranged form has some of the more uh, powerful cards as is. So... Uh, I don't think the precision range thing is necessarily as big a downside as it comes off. Outside of like, you know, the hand size and the precision range, I do think burning losses is something you want to build into your strategy. Just in general, you should be proactive in burning losses at like finding out which losses are going to have their like full effect sooner rather than later and applying those full effects sooner. Now I know a lot of your losses rely on elements, and we'll get to like element leeching here in a second. You don't have as much elemental generation, which is a bit of a problem, but you have a couple ways of generating or stealing elements or bouncing elements back up until you need it. But um, uh, the big thing about uh, the Gemini is you have so much, uh, so many losses, and some of them are situational. But if you see like, hey, I can see a loss that's gonna be really, this is gonna be a good effect for it, just go for it. You have. 14 cards is effectively in your hand. If you find a really good use for a loss that's going to put it like ahead of the curve, just just do that. Like blow up the room, have fun. You have a couple ways here to steal elements or turn elements that you've already created into others or you know whatnot. One of the cool parts about these things is when like an enemy that's completely reliant on a specific element and you're like no this is the element I want. That's pretty cool. So you have a couple cards that can do that. But other than that you have a lot of losses that rely on having specific elements in play and not really any way to generate them. This is kind of uh, one of your ways like Changeling Boon for example which should be able to give you like light or fire. And on the topic of elements, fire definitely if you've not gone through the cards Fire is basically only usable in your range form. Um, it has some effect on some improving some of your uh, power, but it does also improve some of your heals, usually often allowing you to target additional things or adding other effects like regenerate on top of them. Uh, and ice is basically only used in your melee form, which can usually be used as either to increase shields or um, add other effects to stuff, or even just hitting things harder. And it doesn't matter, both forms use light. So you're gonna probably be using light somewhat often, um, just in general. So that's not one that's bad to keep up anyway. So using some of these cards like this to turn elements into something you need. And then every time you end your turn, bounce, like if you're like, oh, I needed light, but I don't need it this turn, just bounce the light back up until you need it. So uh, there's kind of other ways you can play around with it, but ultimately keep in mind that you're, if you want elements in order to get those bonus experience or to get the high effects of these, you're going to have to come up with creative ways to get them. And this could possibly be from items as well. And form swapping tempo. I think a lot, uh, one thing that's pretty critical about this class, if it wasn't incredibly obvious, is that you have to ha bring enough cards that allow you to swap to the other form. And don't burn those cards that will allow you to effectively bail yourself out and get to the other form. Obviously, you can long rest to get to the other form, but if you have um, no way to like render the other hand effective at all, then you're gonna have a problem if you like, well, I have to just effectively stay in this form until I like long rest, and you're forcing yourself to always end in that form with no way to bounce back. So you have many cards that are able to, I mean, again, eight out of your first 18 cards have form swaps on them. Be sure to not burn them so fast that once you get to like the end, you're like, well, I have cards on my other hand and no way to get to it. Uh, that's kind of part of the strategy. We'll be talking about those once we get to the individual cards, but always save one. Um, like you can bounce like say like from melee to range to melee to range you don't have to like say i'm all melee and then all range and now i'm good don't burn the cards until you like don't have another way to get out of it unless of course you've exhausted all your plays in one form and you don't have any other way to get to it in the other form but if you just go into a rest anyway you don't necessarily need to form swap on rests in the first place unless you're going for the mastery 
So we're going to get to the cards, but before I do that, I'm going to talk about a few builds. And I know in one video, some people are like, hey, can we show the builds like starting hands? I don't generally like doing starting hands, and especially not for the Geminate, just because you should use the full array of cards available to you based off of your group, based off of the scenario, and based off of like so many factors that you should not have one hand every scenario. I will say something like as a core card or like, hey, as you level up, if this is the build you're going for, pick this. But that's kind of the general gist. So like, I'm gonna talk about specifically striker controller and later, cause I'm a big fan of fourth edition and I'm a nerd like that. But we're gonna talk about those first. So, so striker build, which is kind of like the basic damage build. Um, this is, should be the default build if you're not sure how to play the Degeminate. Uh, Striker gives you enough of crowd control and like damage and stuff to enough that you should be pretty fine. I just recommend people who um, are, aren't sure how to play to go for this. But if you want just more of a leader role, we have a little bit more of like a half tank, half healer. For the leader form, we're going to be taking a little bit more defensive cards in melee form and a little bit more healy for ranged form. And then we, of course, have the controller, which is going to be focusing much more on being able to put status effects on enemies and being able to effectively reduce their... You're still going to do a decent bit of damage and area effect stuff, but you're also going to be focusing a little bit more on disabling enemies. Disabling enemies is also pretty important because there's a lot of enemies that are super annoying in this. And you have disarms and stuns that can potentially make it a lot easier for your group. So being able to like punch out damage while also being able to do these, some people might lean towards more of a controller build as is. All right, we're gonna start with the melee form first. Um, mostly because the start card 151 and on. We're just gonna be doing them in the num numerical order like I do the other videos. Icebound Quills. This is a really interesting card. First off, Initiative 14 is a good undercut. So you're going to want this for purely uh, initiative purposes anyway for most builds. But also the bottom is pretty nice because not it, it works really well because you want defensive effects on low initiatives. So initiative 14 with a shield and retaliate is really good. That's that's just a good start right there. So the idea is to get into position to where you're gonna be fighting this enemy, go before them, and then you might bounce some damage back and you'll probably reduce some of your incoming damage. Um, the bottom ends up being a pretty, uh, pretty strong just because first off the initiative alone, but also the effects pair well with it. Also, the loss effect on top, if you do have access to eyes, it actually can punch a lot of piercing damage through. But even then, uh, attack five, pierce one, a one experience is a really strong start for one of your biggest punches. Now, your, your largest punch is at level one, and it takes until level three. I probably will look it up. If it's not level three, Stephanie, correct me in the comments and make fun of me. <laughs> She's great at editing. Uh, but no, uh, this, is, this is your biggest punch. Uh, attack five, potentially six. Uh, being able to not only that but ignore some shields too not only that but like um given that you have a lot of like um weaker attacks it's and this it's good to have one powerful attack with shield to deal with those annoying shielded enemies so um but also in general i personally think that if you do are fighting shielded enemies the bottom is actually a pretty good tool for that as well because retaliate will bounce past that Ultimately, though, this is something that most builds are going to take, if only for the initiative and the fact that you do need to undercut stuff, because initiative 14 move 2 isn't great, but, like, Craighart did an initiative 13 move 2 for how long, and it worked out great, so, um, it's definitely a good card, and the situational punch on top, also really good if for, like, bosses, or if you have the way to brittle enemies, this is a one good, very good way to spend, like, hey, you're going to brittle the boss? Cool, let me punch him. Haha. <laughs> Draining pincers. So this is a really, this is one of your core things just because of 72 is late enough on the initiative that you can kind of effectively go behind most enemies. I know there's some like really annoying ones, especially at like 74, but um, ultimately draining pincers, jump three, switch forms. Jump three, switch forms is just a fantastic bottom. Non-loss, jump three, switch forms. This is gonna be one of your big um, abilities to bail yourself out. And the cool part about this is the loss on top is very situational. You're not going to want to reliably do it all the time, but it is tied to a bottom that you're going to need to hold on to anyway to be able to swap forms. So because of that, this is pretty much a very easy must take anyway. Um, 
if anything, it's a core card just because of the bottom. <laughs> so um, obviously this is something you're going to use. But um, keep in mind that if you are in melee form, this is one good way to um, jump out to get yourself into ranged form because you have precision range. You can't just be like, oh, I was in melee form, cool, we'll swap after like charging in. You're, you might put yourself into bad positions. So use this as a way to back out, swap to range, and then go from there rather than charge in because like you'll want to jump to get in melee, punch an enemy, but then you end up in range form and possibly out of position. Uh, the top, on the other hand, is an attack three in this big spiky line in front of you. And if you have light, um, you get to have advantage on all those attacks which is cool, um, but attack three on all of them and one experience is fine. I personally am not as big of on this because I think attack three with a very specific formation is harder to do. As a matter of fact, you got some non lost stuff on the Panner Spare that can do similar things to this, but um, it's not a bad attack, but the bottom's obviously super core. And the thing is, you're like, well, the top could potentially be situational, but because it's got such a reliable bottom, you can potentially hold on until that perfect moment and use this when it indeed pays off the most. So it's obviously going to be a core card for the bottom alone, but yeah, top's not bad. Ornate Stinger, so another form swap, but the cool part about this is um, the 23 isn't great, but it's usually early enough that it can, you can pair it well pretty decently. We're going to talk about the bottom for a second. Move 3 and then all attacks targeting you have disadvantage. 23 is generally quick enough to undercut most of those, but you have a couple other ways to get under 23, but not by much. Um, I, I think the bottom's pretty generally perfectly fine. Disadvantage usually pays off pretty decently too, so also it could potentially wait to make yourself crit immune for a round as well. So that's pretty solid. But the top is one of my favorites just because you have five hexes. That's it's not even that hard to pull off, but it's because um, I hate the amount of crappy attacks you have that are like twos and threes. Being able to pierce three on all these, um, you're able to break through all these shields. So even weak enemies that have um, high shields, one damage could potentially be a lot, but also it leaves all of them poisoned. And it does also, after you do this, allow you to form swap. The problem is usually um, at this position, <laughs> if you're trying to surround yourself by enemies or get next to two or three, you're probably not in a position you want to be in range form. So that's the only drawback, but being able to hammer out a lot of like attacks uh, and then poison everything in the area, including your allies. You do poison all allies in the area, but that's been relatively small. I do think this one has um, one of your, uh, I guess it's one of your bigger, bigger impact cards, I'd say. Um, but, you know, bottom's, bottom's pretty solid. I think ultimately I like, you know, Icebound Quills a little bit better, but um, Brain Stopped. In general, I find the top of Hornet Stingers to be better in larger players because if you can get poison a larger number because there's just more monsters in far player slapping poison on all of them and allowing like more players to pile on them it just pays off more so this might not be as important if you're playing like in two player for example changeling spoon i know it's very sad that if we changed the enhancement system to i mean it's not that sad but like the the, the fact that the top is a square and not a diamond because you could just put it poison on that and then follow it up immediately uh i know that was probably talked about during, you know, testing, but alas. Uh, the Initiative 40 isn't great, it's not it's not terrible, but it is, I would consider, unreliable. But um, this is one of your cool cards that if you can set it up right, like if we previously talked about Hornet Stingers, if you can poison things, uh, the problem is with the Hornet Stingers, you're probably going to be swapping to the ranged form, so you have to find a way to swap back to this. Just poison enemies, but then um, two attack two. So if you're attacking this on... Um, poisoned enemies. This is two attack threes and pays off notably more. However, also if you're fighting against enemies or retaliate, this is one way to just kill yourself. So don't do that. That's generally not advised. Um, but in in general, I'd say that the the top of it is pretty solid. You've got plenty of status effects, poison enemies, and then lap on them with this, and you'll it, the payoff's pretty good. The bottom, on the other hand, is pretty nice because. First off, it allows you to sh um, shapeshift into the range form, and it does shuffle another Bless into your deck, which is great. But also then for the rest of the scenario, you can uh, convert elements any at the any time you uh, end your turn into fire or light. 
And this is pretty strong because you have no real way to generate elements reliably. So being able to convert any element, like especially if you're like allies generated a thing and they're like, well, I'm not using that. Like the Banner Spirit might not be using air, but they might be using Javelin to generate it. You could say, hey, I'm going to turn the air into light and I need it for um, this uh, attack I'm going to do to get an advantage on all those attacks. So boom, this is one way you can do it. And this lasts for the whole scenario. And even then, if you see like, oh, this enemy's created ice and it's gonna use it to brittle us potentially. No, just turn the ice into like fire or light and just like give them the middle finger. I'm not actually gonna give them the middle finger. I'm not that mean. But um, uh, personally, I think the um, the bottom's actually pretty strong, especially if you are going to be using some of those cards reliably that need fire or light. Especially once we get to start cards that start adding plus one target if you have the correct element. Um, that's, it really starts to pay off more then, but this is a, still a strong card. It might not be as strong at level one then. Reckless Jab. Um, so I love this. Um, so this is an attack two, which is just a default action. The initiative 38 is okay. But um, uh, specifically, if you don't have wound, wound yourself and you can add disarm. And wounding yourself isn't so bad because you do have some heal selves, which we'll get to those here in a bit, but uh, just having the ability to potentially disarm enemies at the cost of wounding yourself isn't so bad, but then you can also poison yourself um, to make this an attack four. So this can effectively turn into an attack four disarm, non-loss, and all you have to do is give yourself two status effects. Two status effects that you can easily just do the move to heal two, which we'll get to that card in a second, to bump both of them off. The heal, obviously, the poison will soak up the heal, but just, it's pretty easy. Not only that, but um, the one we get to the items, I'm going to talk about this card, Amulet of Life. It's just one easy way to, like, toss all, like, your bad effects off, like, brittle, poison, wound, and crap, like, just boop, and every long rest, you can get it back. So, um, that's probably, uh, the whole point is, is an attack for disarm, and with the ability to control the ability to, like, get the drawbacks off is very valuable. I personally think this is one of your best melee form cards. Just use this and knock enemies around, make prevent them from attacking while you just, like, you know, slap them in that, which is great. Um, now, the bottom is an attack four. On, attack four on bottom is nice. Of course, it is a loss. But if you have ice or light in play, you also stun the enemy. So this is pretty big about, like, obviously we talked about Changeling Boom being able to convert anything into light. You'll be able to turn that into light and turn this attack into an attack four stun, which is honestly pretty good for a level one. I mean, especially with the amount of losses you can play, just being able to burst out some damage. Um, the funny part is I actually saw... And it wasn't me, it was another player I was playing alongside, and um, we, had, we had this uh, poisoned enemy and like a poisoned boss, and we we're like, we need to drop this guy real fast. And uh, Icebound Quills and Reckless Jab, they use the ice for the quills, not the jab part. But um, just being able to do an attack seven, attack four, and I don't know how they got strengthened, but they were strengthened, or maybe they I forget, but attack seven, attack four, the Geminate was actually just able to, with two losses, just drop a significant amount of the boss's health. So bottom attacks are just valuable to begin with. So um, yeah, but a stun built in with it as well. Um, personally, I think this one, the stun's very valuable for like those enemies with like large health pools that aren't like non-boss enemies with large health pools. So of which um, in Frosthaven, you start off fighting Alcox, which have increased health pools compared to like their Inox friends. So just keep that in mind, this, especially because you start fighting them at the beginning and guess what? Gemini's a starter, so it might actually pay off instantly. So uh, food for thought there. I personally think that it doesn't matter. The top of the card's worth bringing in the first place. Drag down, a uh, fantastic card. Um, you have like, th the thing can be rotated one way or the other way. Ultimately, I actually think that this is one of your best attacks. <laughs> Not only that, but um, attack two with um, immobilize on them, and then you can like just move away. It doesn't matter if you can get like, it's very easy in my opinion to get like two enemies in this. So attack two on two enemies, potentially three. I don't think I've gotten three. Actually, can I have ever, ever, ever done three in this? Anyway, it doesn't matter. Whole point is, is you can reliably immobilize enemies, move away, and then watch as they like, hey, I can't do anything because I'm immobilized and not near anything. Use that. But not only that, but it allows you to, um, this is really good to set up ranged because you can say, hey, I'm going to mobilize you. I'm going to back out. So now I'm in ranged form, but you're immobilized over there. So now I can hit pelt you with ranged attacks on the next turn. 
uh, works really well. Probably one of the core cards you're going to be bringing for a while. The initiative 34 is not great, but you can play around that. Uh, I'm not a big fan of most of the Geminids cards initiatives, but they have a cute, like, Ice Cop Quills is obviously really strong, so it's pretty random, but this one probably is too good to have a great initiative anyway. On the other hand, the bottom is a jump four. Oh, it's a loss, but then disarm two enemies next to you. Ah, uh, that's so good. Um, you get an experience too, but all the losses I think have one experience built into them, potentially two if you have the right elements. But ultimately, jump four, disarm. It's really good. It's a really good way to like um, have immediate impact to say like, hey, I'm gonna get into melee. And I've, I've prepared for this before, but then like realized, oh, the enemies aren't attacking and just use a move too. You can kind of like bail out, get closer. Uh, but if you can see, like, these enemies, this room's going to be annoying. Jump in, soften up, like, to stop two attacks while still being able to bring your uh, top um, card as well. That This is a really good, it's a really good situational bottom that can pay off a lot, tied to a top that you're going to reliably want to bring anyway, which makes it a really good card. Horn Beetle Carapace. So, um, initiative 20 is good. Um, move one, shield one self, or shield two self is the bottom. If you have ice, you shield to self and hey, experience on a non-lost card. That's pretty great. Uh, so it's more li likely move one, shield one self. But when you do have ice, it's nice to have that shield too. Um, if you are going for more of a like leader controller kind of thing, the bottom of this is actually pretty strong. However, the top is very strong for uh, damage. It just says, I know, like I don't like the the icons. Not gonna lie, it's just not that cool. But the um, uh, for the next four attacks in melee form, do those four attacks get plus one, but they're plus two in ranged form. So if you do reliably do this with like an AoE, you can like turn like, I'm gonna attack these three guys with attack three. It's like attack these three with attack five. Becomes notably different. So yeah, and you get two experience from this as well. So I personally think that this is a very easy card to pick. Um, it, on average, will add up to about 8 damage, but it's still pretty strong as is. The initiative's good enough to, if you don't want to burst out the damage instantly, you can use the bottom to effectively set yourself up to have a little bit of damage reduction, or you can play around the initiative. Ultimately, though, this is, um, this is pretty, this is a pretty solid card, in my opinion. So, um, I, I'd consider it one of the mandatory cards for whatever build, because it doesn't matter which style of play you're going for. It, one half of the card brings something you need, plus it's got a good initiative. Flowing Tendrils! I know the first time I saw this I was like, what's going on? You get to muddle all your allies in the area, which isn't that bad, but it's kind of annoying. Uh, but it is on a weak attack one. Uh, the cool part about Flailing Tendrils is of course that lovely initiative 12, which we, like, that's great. I know when I was complaining about a bunch of these. The Gemini just has so many cards that you can bitch about some initiatives and then say this is really good. Um, but it is only a weak attack one muddle on all enemies in the area. That's a very weird area and kind of hard to set up. With light, it's attack two. Um, not as big a fan of this, uh, but yeah, I, I mean, although I like the initiative, it's hard to use the top. Um, it, it, it does get notably better with light generation, so if you have an ally who can help you with that, or if you have, like, change of the booms to get that into play, obviously. That's one way because changing attack ones to twos is pretty significant, but it's like a lot that requires a bit of setup for like something with a drawback that's not necessarily that great. Uh, and then the bottom is a loss, but you wound all all enemies within range two, all allies within range two, and it does give you fire, which is great, but like uh, obviously you have to use fire in your um, ranged form, and this is a melee form card, so you have to pair it with another swap to do to swap to the ranged form this round, while also setting up these wounds, which you could potentially wound your allies. In the end, I've I've played this card a couple times, and I. Um, <laughs> It, I just don't bring it anymore. Um, it has its uses, obviously. Wound is useful against enemies that do, like, if you do, like, fight living spirits, for example, this is very effective against them, or flame, you know, flame demons. So it has its uses, but just be wary that this is probably not going to necessarily be the, um, the best card. The only really great thing it's going for it is the initiative. Feeding Frenzy. So, um, interesting card. Um, the loot is, I mean, 
Actually, I, I swear... I, might, I I need to, like, check early versions. I swear the first one had the loot and then the damage, which I thought was, like, really dumb. Anyway, the bottom, at least, is, like, damage everything next to you and then loot, which is fine, but, like, it's hard to, like, want a bottom loot. I don't... I'm not a big fan of bottom loots, but, like, bottom loots that also have, like, hurting your allies built into them. I guess if, like, if you have enemies that are, like, at one health... You can kill them and loot them instantly. Like, it's a situational, but 62 is not very reliable to trigger that. And then you have a persistent effect that does give you light and experience. But uh, whenever you kill an enemy during your turn, um, you can either choose to switch forms or ignore the switch forms on things. Now, um, that can be useful if you want to go for the mastery, but ultimately I've just found that it's easier to just kind of play the class using your normal form switches. Um... This certainly has some effects. Obviously, if you do need to, like, there's some scenarios where it says, like, you need to loot this item, and the this can't be looted with end of turn looting. Obviously, this is the card to bring because you do have um, a loot. It's one of your only loot cards, or is it your only loot card? I didn't post. Is it the only loot card? Um, but no, um, I don't think the top effect, like. You can potentially control what form you're in based off of killing enemies is necessarily worth it. And I think the bottom's perfectly, um, I think it's perfectly fine. Uh, the bottom's fine. The top is hard to use and I'm not a big fan. All right. We're going to get into the range form now. And I've been talking for a long time. <laughs> um, selfless offering, um, heal three, range three. Um, this is a very basic level one action, except for one very specific, two very specific things. Number one, this can only target an ally. Like this is, if this was heal three, range three, that was it. That would be a little bit stronger, but it can only target allies. Boo. However, you can consume fire to also give those allies regen. And uh, not gonna lie, I think regen's pretty strong, especially if you, like, you know, with a bone shaper who might be hurting themselves a lot, you could potentially get a little bit more mileage out of it. So personally, I think this is a um, really strong the initiative. 27 is fine, but um, I, I think that the effect on it is perfectly fine. Also, it's experience on a non-lost card. So given that Gemini kind of has struggles with experience and non-lost cards, if you have fire, you can kind of turn this into playing a little bit more of a support role here. Um, move three and shift to melee form is still pretty strong at this level. But um, uh, keep in mind also, by the way, there's some like really annoying status effects and some effects like, you know, frozen corpses that'll move forward and like immobilize and brittle uh, that regenerate can often like knock off effects like that. So just keep in mind, I personally, I think this is a pretty good card, but um, I, I just keep in mind, it's definitely more of a, it's not going to be the thing for every group, but even then the bottom is going to be useful for a Gemini anyway, if you're not really into the whole healing pit. <laughs> into my embrace, initiative 36. Honestly, the initiative could be anything. Love this card. Attack three at range three or four specifically, and then pull them two. Now, there's a lot of really annoying stuff in Frosthaven. There's ice spikes that do damage. There's a lot of traps and stuff. There's enemies that create traps. Obviously, Gloomhaven had those as well. But needing a ranged pull is just a really good tool anyway. But not only that, but it's an attack three at range that also pulls. Really good card. Um, but the cool part is the thematic bit of like, hey, I'm going to take you at range. Pull him now. You're in melee. But now I'm going to swap form to the melee form. It just sets itself up so well. So this is definitely one of the cards you're going to be bringing, if only because there is that big payoff for um, either like the synergy between melee going into range or range form going into melee and or uh, being able to screw with whatever's on the map and make the enemy suffer those rather than trying to deal with it yourself. The bottom, on the other hand, is a nice heal for self that also regenerates yourself. I know it's a loss, but this is a really a nice heal. And that also, if you do have fire or light, you can also strengthen yourself as well. This is a bottom strengthen, so you can pair this with, of course, a uh, top of thing. Like, we're going to talk about what Firefly Swarm here in a second, where if you're able to um, uh, strengthen yourself as part of it, you can do a lot more damage. I know there's like a lot of... Uh, actions. Oh, well, there's a lot of losses. If you're going to horn a beetle carapace and into my embrace and then firefly, that's like three losses. Yeah. And that puts you down to 11 if you burn three losses. So calm down. But that's a lot of damage. That would be, with that specific combo, that'd be 
what, three attack fives with an advantage? That's not bad. Um, but ultimately, though, it's um, a very, very reliable top, and then the bottom is something you put, can potentially use as an oh crap button. Everyone brings this card. Speaking of Firefly Swarm, here it is. Um, initiative 76, good enough to go late. Move four. Um, if it wasn't pretty obvious from my other guys, especially on Geminit, who has some kind of interestingly tuned cards, a very boring move four is kind of a refreshing change of pace. Uh, but also I love move fours that are late or early, so the fact that this move four is at least 76, I would have liked maybe 86, but you know, can't have everything. Uh, but also it's a really strong AoE because it's an attack three on everything, but if you have fire, it's an attack four on everything in this little um, triangle formation. Uh, the enemies must be three or four away, so you can't have enemies that are like two away, but or put this like at range four and then knock enemies at five. It's very specific, but even then, it's still pretty strong. You get one or two experience if you had fire. Uh, it's a very strong AoE that's, I don't think it's that hard to use, and it's tied to a bottom of the move four. Basically, most builds are going to be bringing this. Scarab Flight, initiative 30, um, which is fine. Um, but it does give you another forced move uh, ability at range, which is pretty nice. Um, the whole thing is that line, this is usually what ends up people asking, at, this is what I've heard people ask more questions about, because they think you can place the line at range 3-4 and then do a bunch of attack 2s in it, but you create a template and then attack all enemies that are at range 3 or 4 within that template. Which is kind of annoying to use but hey it could be worse but it's a, a potentially a couple of attack twos i mean it could be three attack twos but that's hard to do um but this does at least allow you to like knock enemies away potentially into hazards or traps or if you need them into formations such as you know the, the flyer fire firefly swarm that we just previously talked about though so um it's it's pretty solid but the bottom is definitely the more tanky version of it where it's um a, you get shield one on the next four attacks against you, unless you're in melee form, which is shield two. Combined with stuff like Icebound Quills, you can potentially like shield three, retaliate one yourself, which is pretty strong. So um, uh, it definitely has its uses, but you clearly have to like uh, put this in range form, swap to melee to be able to get the best use out of it. Personally, I think the um, it's definitely conditional. It's something that's probably a bit more rotational, but if you are going for more of those AoEs and need to knock enemies into specific paths, this is one way you can do it. Mind Spike, initiate, initiate 18 is good. Um, so the bottom is pretty cool. It is a ranged attack. A t a ranged, hey, it's a ranged bottom attack. That's what we want. Okay, so attack two at range three or four and swap form, which is great. Attack two, range three, four, swap form. Wonderful. Uh, the top, on the other hand, is also, like, first off, um, if you do, like, let's say you swapped from melee form to ranged form, and now you have this, or, like, let's say you're using this as an opener, um, this is pretty strong as is. However, I do think the general thing is, um, it doesn't allow you to reposition yourself very well, because you're gonna, you're gonna swap to melee form with this, um, and, uh, you don't have a bottom to potentially move into position, but maybe you're going early enough with that initial 18 that, um, that that's going to potentially pay off a little bit more like i'm going to blast them at range now i'm swapping the melee form and it doesn't matter because they're going to get closer so hopefully that's the payoff in general i don't like the the anti-synergy of some of the cards like into my embrace is really well but this one's kind of like the opposite of that where you can't move into position and get this but it is a non-loss bottom ranged attack so hard to complain about that Mind Spike, on the other hand, pick three enemies, or four if you have light, and immobilize them. Um, this is really good for hard crowd control, especially if you're fighting enemies that are basically strictly melee attacking. And then all enemies that you did this way just suffer one damage, so you can immobilize enemies and make them suffer one, which is perfectly fine. It's also pretty strong against enemies with shield that are kind of annoying like that, but... I think a lot of sh like really annoying shielded enemies also have ranged attacks, so it ends up being a little bit worse there, but you still have some things like, you know, frozen corpses, which can be really annoying, but they're, um, you can say, hey, I know you've been taking a couple turns to get to us, but now you, you three are immobilized, you're all going to suffer one damage and it ignores your one shield, which is pretty great. So, uh, it has its uses, it's a conditional top and tied to a bottom that's really reliable, so it's a good card. 
Harvest the Essence, kind of like the swap of um, Changeling's Boon, where um, it, does, it does ward yourself, and it says every time you end your turns, you can uh, consume any element to turn it into light or ice. This, this is another card that you can use to get light, but this one also gives you ice, which is only usable in melee form. But it does swap you into melee form when you do this, so that's a thing. Um, I tend to like Changeling Boon a little bit better, mostly because I lean more on the fire expanding things, but some of the ice expanding things are still really strong too, especially if you are like getting more of a leader build, so um, that's still a pretty decent card. The bottom, on the other hand, is super useful, so I know I was, like, felt, felt like it might be a little bit down on the card, but it doesn't matter because the bottom heal move to heal to self. Everyone was talking about how, like, well, Empathetic Assault and the Mind Thief is too strong. Like, yeah, honestly, move to heal two is a really good vile assault from the drifter as well. And not only that, but it's, um, but given that you have some heals that are like allies only, you don't have a lot of self heals that are not tied to losses. So, um, bring this hail of thorns. So, um, initiate eight is very late. I like that. Um, the bottom's a move three with no other effect, which is boring, but you can burn light to wound an adjacent enemy after that. Um, with no experience but just like turning light in something it's hard to get into wound is something i'm not super sold on it's it's not bad but i'm not i'm not a big fan of this but on the other hand uh, i do like the top the top is a attack two on everything within range two not even precision range this is just attack two on everything within range two and then also muddle all those enemies. Give yourself ice without having to leech it at the cost of muddling your allies that were in range too. This is definitely one of your better like door kickers, obviously. Into my embrace is your best breaching tactic because being able to like, hey, I'm going into this next room. You, you're coming to the door and now it's a little bit blocked. And you can kind of like pick your battles there. But Hail of Thorns is another way to potentially like go very late after like some someone kicked into the room. Use one of your long moves like... um. You know, Firefly Swarm, and then move in there, blow up everything, then use um, Swap to um, pick one of your early initiative cards and go to kind of like double tap there. Um, personally, I think that's one of the stronger things, but um, uh, yeah, I, I'm. it's it's a potentially an okay card, especially if you're fighting those. There's some like really annoying enemies like uh, Snow Imps and um, I guess Black Imps too, but uh, like Lightning Eels and stuff, or you can AoE large groups of them. And this is just one way to deal with them. Also, the lightning eels with their stupid uh, stun attack. Um, just being able to get them out of the way is potentially really useful. But um, if you do need an AoE, this is kind of your thing. So bring those to scenarios. Bring this, obviously, to those scenarios. Smoldering Hatred. I remember the first version of this. It's changed. <coughs> it used to be notably better because I think it was like plus one target. Unless I'm remembering it wrong. I probably am. But... Um, it's an attack two at range four or five, which obviously sucks. So you're have, gonna have to like dunk some status effects on yourself. Muddle self, which happens sadly instantly. You can turn this into an attack four, and curse self. You can turn this into two attack fours, provided the enemies are next to each other, or two attack twos if you don't want to muddle yourself. But um, what you can do is, put, at the cost of muddling and cursing yourself, you could get two ranged attack fours on an unlost card. So this still has some value there. The, the, the fact that this one at least gets you potentially a two, like, good multi-attack non-loss stuff is still a pretty strong card. The initiative 32 is fine, um, but two, two attack fours is really strong. I know it's Muddle and Curse, but the cool part that you can do to mitigate this is to potentially in the next round uh, focus a little bit more on, like, healing or defensive things to um, mitigate the fact that they're, or maybe, I don't know, kill the enemies, but um, modeling them is obviously going to be a little bit of a problem. You can potentially bring some of the starting items, like a Spyglass or something, to counteract the model, but I personally wouldn't bring Spyglass, because that takes the same slot as, like, Amulet of Life, but it's still a pretty strong card. The bottom is a little bit more weird. Um, it's good for, like, the fact that you're in ranged form, like, immobilize enemies and jump out, but um, it requires a very specific setup, like enemies have to have moved near you, and then you go early enough that you can immobilize them to uh, reduce the threat and then jump away so you can use some attack. I don't know. Um, it, it always sounds like, on paper, it sounds like this will be really good, but then uh, and it hasn't played out for me. Maybe I'm just bad. <laughs> but um, I don't think it's super impressive there. The top's still usable, though. 
and reshape the guys because reshaping guys is pretty fun this is the better loot guard i know you're talking hey, i was gonna say i thought there was a second one um <clears throat> this is your better loot card loot regen self um not only that but the the regen self is just really good if you do have like wound and poison from like reckless jab this is one way to um getting that also it does like it's the opposite of what feeding frenzy yeah, yeah, that, it, it's the opposite of feeding frenzy because feeding frenzy is on the the have it has it flipped too, um, but top top loots are notably better because you can move into position and then scoop some stuff up and not only that the regen self pays off pretty well in my opinion and the bottom persistent kind of allows you to have more control when you short rest first off it says that when you short rest normally when you play the geminate you can only choose which form you leave uh, long rests in and so. Uh, and if you have to short rest, you have to continue in the form you're in. But if you have reshaped the guys, on a short rest you can choose to swap forms. And on the short rest you can actually choose, instead of shuffling all your cards randomly, you can choose to pick which card it is. Uh, and then it also gives you light and one experience. I personally think that Feeding Frenzy is harder to use, and I personally think that this is much a much better toolkit because a mu much better addition to your toolkit because since you have like 14 cards to work with um being able to like pick the one you lose during short rest also means that if you do have to short rest um you don't have to um like <laughs> you, you you don't have to lose a card that you didn't want to lose like let's say you have like lose into my embrace and you're like i want to reshuffle this but i could potentially like lose one of my other cards that i've been like saving no, you don't need to worry about that. You can control which cards you want to lose, the one that's least impactful of the scenario, the one like, well, I don't need this anymore, etc. And not only that, but it also allows you to convert short rusts into being able to form swap. Um, this also kind of makes the masteries a little bit easier to get. I personally think Reshape the Guys is um, one of those potential ways, because usually when it comes to <laughs> the, the, the Geminate uh, masteries, it's resting that or like actions around resting or losing cards during rest that ends up making the class the mastery is harder to get so personally i'm a big fan of shaping the guys unlike uh, feeding frenzy so those are the first 18 cards that you have to deal with and i know that that's a lot so for the level one starting like core cards that you're going to want to use at least at least at level one and leveling up um, I do think, in general, Reckless Jab for the melee form is going to be a core card. It just does too much damage as hard crowd control, and you can undo the downside for it. Um, Horn Beetle Carapace just does too much damage for your range form that I think I consider it mandatory, and Drag Down and Draining Pincers for the um, either for forms for very easy form shifting as well as um, their other purposes, but just. For form control, those two are the way to go. For range form, Into My Embrace is your, one of your core cards that you're going to be bringing for a long time. Firefly Swarm is a very usable like, non-loss move for, as well as a, tied to a good bottom. And you have Selfless Offering and Mind Spike. And Mind Spike's bottom attack at range is too good. And uh, Selfless Offering gives you um, form swap and um, healing, which you need as well. But I'd also, for the melee form, consider Icebound Quills until you have another form, uh, another initiative undercut for it. For range form, you don't really have any undercut except for Flailing Tendrils, which is uh, not a great card to pick anyway, but like it's still usable. But Icebound Quills is one of your undercuts. So um, consider bringing cards to make sure you have enough ability to, um, when needed, to go before the enemies when they do so just food for thought there but i think those eight cards are probably the core but nine if you include icebound quills so um we're gonna leave it there and um let's get into the level two cards i think that no matter what build it is these are things you're going to need to bring just for their utility and the other cards are going to build up depending on your play style and obviously at level two and higher you're going to be picking different cards depending on your play style and i'll let you know which build should pick what but um Personally, I'm a big fan of, you know, the striker build, so we're going to be defaulting on that, but uh, let's just get into the level two cards. All right, we have Venomous Barbs. Um, retaliate two at range two, obviously pretty cool. Range retaliates are obviously better than melee. You can get close and at least the range enemies will back up, or the melee enemies will, you know, still attack you at melee. Um, obviously, you get, uh, oh, you also get one experience for every time you retaliate this round, so this is one way to get a handful of, uh, <laughs> 
uh, experience. But the cool part about this is you can pair, the Initiative 17 obviously works really well with a Retaliate, but you can pair this with some of your shields or get like Scarab Flight and Play to like while in melee form to reduce your incoming damage, potentially Icebound Quills and stack this up a bunch. But obviously you can also disarm yourself. If you disarm yourself instead of Retaliate 2, Range 2, it's Retaliate 3, Range 3, which becomes pretty significant. Um, this is a very high impact loss, I personally think. You can pair it up with like a defensive turn, help save your friends, potentially like with like your shield effects can reduce a lot of incoming damage while bouncing a lot back. I personally think that this is one of the better losses you can kind of play around. But even then, if it is a loss, the bottom is something that's really strong. It's a, it's just a bottom attack, but a bottom attack too with poison built in. And on a good initiative too. So, um, obviously I'm pretty high on Venomous Barbs. It doesn't mean that you can, like, pair, like, um, this works really well with, for example, Changeling's Boon. Where you can attack two poison on bottom, go early, usually before enemies go, then attack three, attack three. Effectively, your average damage at this point is, without, with, on a basic modifier deck, eight damage, going at initiative 17, which is really strong. So, personally... Um, Venom's Barbs is obviously a winner, and uh, this is a, just a pretty strong card. But not only that, but since you do have a lot of like multi attacks or things like that, obviously, like change the boom, the combo the right there. But um, <laughs> it's just a really good card. Um, it just pairs really well with itself. I, I don't want to seem like I'm down on Locust Toast, because like Locust Toast is fine, but um, anyway, we're going to get into that card. Uh, initiative 23. Um, it's a loss on top, but it's uh, you can attack up to five hexes. The, uh, and the enemies can be at range two this time, which is nice, but and attack all enemies at range two or three within this five hex pattern, and that's pretty great. But you can curse yourself and potentially do a gigantic line, which is, I don't know, it's hard to set that up, but it's possible. But you do get two experience for it. Two experience for a loss, pretty great. But the bottom is move one, and then push all enemies that are exactly two away. Boom. This is very good just like getting enemies into range to be able to attack them, get them into formations or knock them into potentially obstacles. That said, um, uh, the pushing effect can have some pretty cool effects, but um, the AoE there is just... Not, I'm, I found Locust Toast notably more um, situational than, say, using Venomous Barbs, which it's pretty easy to use. I know that there's like a disarm on the loss, but the top is... the bottom is really good and the top has... I think some pretty good effects. So I generally consider all Geminate builds to go for Venomous Barbs, but um, if you are going for more like, you know, the controller or leader builds, I don't necessarily think that the push effect is bad or that the AoE effect is off, but I do think that that's something you can play around with. But um, if you're really concerned, like I'm not sure which one's better or how to use it, Venomous Barbs is very easy to play. And although the payoff for, um, uh, Locust Host can potentially be significant. I think it requires a little bit more thought, and you have to like have enemies specifically at specific ranges, and then a little bit more forced movement is might not be something you want in your toolkit. But for those, especially some of those really annoying scenarios, um, looking at you, Marcel. Also, he designed this class, so who knows? Maybe that was deliberate. But um, where there's a lot of uh, stuff on the board, this is potentially some way to abuse that, and that's really strong. Level 3, Mandible Storm versus Dragonfly Surge. Mandible Storm is um, really strong because, first off, um, you muddle yourself, which is the problem, but it's potentially a lot of attack threes that immobilize and form swap. Giving yourself another good um, form swap for melee form is never a bad thing, and um, that's it's an interesting, like, um, opposite side thing. It reminds me of Crackheart's Opposing Strike, I think, but... Um, the immobilized built-in is fine, if provided that you've already set yourself into position uh, to use this thing and use the bottom to move out. You can potentially use this as hard crowd control. Uh, the bottom is a little bit weirder. Move three, shield two self, and or shield three if you have ice or light. And you have one experience or two experience if you burn the elements. Obviously a loss, because move three, shield three would be too good on a non-loss. Every class would want that on a non-loss. I, I think that there's some uses for the bottom, but I think that the, the, the top has enough power in itself 
and I'm not a big fan of the muddling yourself going into range, but again, you could use the range form to have a support action or like maybe uh, use some of your forced move and things to like relying on pushing your enemies into traps instead of like doing the raw damage for it. But that's an option. Um, but Mandible Storm is a pretty strong card. Initiative 30 is fine. But Dragonfly Search, Initiative 50 is trash. That's like my least favorite initiative ever. Um, yeah, initiative, I don't know, initiative 51's probably. I'm gonna say 51's my least favorite initiative on cards. So this one's pretty shit on initiative, but I love the card. I like Dragonfly Surge. Um, so let's, the top is pretty basic. It's just an attack six at range four or five. So the enemy must be very far away and you just dunk a big attack on them. But if you have light or fire, uh, the attack has advantage and wounds as well and gives you one exper or two experience instead of one. Attack 6 with advantage and wound is just really good to just dunk on enemies. Um, that's very strong. Huge fan of this uh, for a loss. Um, you don't have a lot of those um, big burst things that are easy to set up, so Dragonfly Surge is very welcome. Uh, not only that, but you don't have a lot of, like, you have a lot of um, AoE in your ranged form, so giving yourself a single big hit is pretty strong. The bottom, on the other hand, makes you poison yourself which is not great, but then um, you have advantage and pierce two on all your attacks this turn, which is really good. And even if you do just one attack, turning like, hey, I'm gonna turn this attack three into um, attack three, pierce two with advantage. I mean, come on, that's really good. But not only that, but um, keep in mind, since this form does have a lot of your AoEs, um, I guess the melee one does too, but since there, you do have a lot of AoEs, getting um, Pierce 2 and advantage on all your attacks this round pays off significantly more than you swap to the melee form. Um, this one's, the bottom's pretty easy to use. Again, I think that there's plenty of ways for you to clear debuffs, and another reason why I suggest Amulet of Life. I think I mentioned that earlier. But um, uh, one of the biggest things is um, it's just a very strong thing. I, I would definitely try to pair this with ranged attacks that have earlier initiatives so you don't have this whole thing get like ruin you so um just just a heads up that that's something to worry about because you don't want to just have sp attacks that are um supposed to be a very specific set of hexes away and then just have them get ruined alternatively you could just immobilize the enemies and then um move away like with drag down which will allow you to swap your range form and then do this and you'll know that the enemies are immobilized because you immobilize them so but i really am really big fan of the bottom um strikers go for a dragonfly surge without thinking about it i think if you're going for a controller or a leader build mandible storm is not a bad pick um just in general i don't think that if you're going specifically for um control or support that you're probably not going to be leaning into just big surge of damage but i think a controller could lean into uh dragonfly surge if only because if you do bring a lot of aoe's that uh, the bottom of that could pay off pretty well so but the mandible swarm's pretty good for either of those builds just to be able to like the controller probably wants to immobilize things move out and the leader can use it well for damage prevention it's just it's a pretty solid pick for both even though i like dragonfly surge a lot Level 4, Thresh and Flail, and Luminous Descent. Thresh and Flail is attack 4, attack 3, attack 2, light, loss. Very nice. Um, hopefully the enemy doesn't have retaliate. Um, this would be the perfect time for a... Don't know if I want to get into spoiler items, but this would be really cool with Strengthen. Uh, actually, you have the ability to strengthen yourself, but yeah, use a bottom strength and then use this. So it's an attack 4 with advantage, attack 3 with advantage, attack 2 with advantage, get light lose. That's a really strong card. I, I think that this is one of your best ways to burn through enemies. But um, uh, if you do need to go at an early initiative, this is really pairs really very well with Venomous Barbs to attack to poison to turn this into 5-4-3 instead. Um, if you fight high health enemies or a boss that's not immune to poison, Venomous Barbs plus Thresh and Flail is one way to just burn through that stuff. We love it. Um... The bottom is dumb. See, the problem is I love Thresh and Flail for like, it's a good loss, but then the bottom's harder to use. It's a pull three at range four, which is, you do want pulls on your melee form because you could potentially like hammer away enemies that are like far away. But 
Uh, it is nice because with light, uh, first off, you get an experience and unloss, but you can pull two enemies, pull three, which is still pretty strong. Um, pull, pulling two enemies is great, but I'm, I'm not a big fan of the bottom as is, so. I guess what I'm trying to say is it has its uses, and I love the top, but I wish the bottom was a little bit more usable. Luminous Descent, on the other hand, is a, yeah, is a, it kind of reminds me of like the mirror of itself, and there's a lot of these like mirrored effects, like where the, um, there's light generation on the top of one and bottom of the other, and there's like a plus one target on either, so this is a, uh, I'm just going to get to it, heal four, one ally within range three, but if you uh, consume light, I guess Thresh and Flail also creates an element. I literally forgot to say that. Um, going back to the bottom of Thresh and Flail. But if you do consume the light, you can create fire or ice. Um, now, if you swap form, you can use that fire immediately. Or if you stay in melee form, depending on what top you're bringing, um, you can use the ice for a really cool effect. So um, being able to turn light into whatever element you need is still pretty strong. But again, two poles is not as strong as some other effects. Whereas Luminous, Luminous Descent has a heal four, range three, target one ally, but if you consume light, you can, first off, um, very similar to Thresh and Flail, um, you can turn that light into fire or ice as you need it, but you can target two allies instead. So heal four on two allies, I think is significantly more, that's, that, that's a good effect. The bottom on the other hand is a very strong effect. Uh, jump five, stun two adjacent enemies, and then create light. That's, that's good. Um, Move, uh, there's there's a lot of these um, cards that Jonah has that kind of has a, a hybrid effect where instead of having like a super powerful like bottom, it's got movement built into them. So like like a move, create an element and do some cool effect. So jump five, stun two enemies and create light is still pretty strong. Um, but anyway, stuns are stuns are really good. It doesn't matter if it's non loss or not. So. Obviously, strikers want Thresh and Flail, and um, that leaders want Luminous Descent. I think it's pretty obvious, but I do think in general that um, controller could go both ways. Being able to pull enemies towards you is definitely pretty strong, and obviously some burst damage is never going to be turned down, but the ability to have an on-command jump stun and give yourself an element that you need while also having some light could potentially go for the controller build as well. So I do think that the controller build probably leans towards Thresh and Flail. And it also depends on player count. If you're playing like two player, you're probably not going for Luminous Descent just because I think it's, you know, fewer enemies might be more difficult to set up a two stun when you need it. It's probably not, but um, in general, um, two enemies that were in melee range that you need an on-demand to worthy enough of burning your level four and then also healing two allies might just not be it just may not but you could just bring it for the jump five stun convert an element or and gain an element that could just be worth it for you because in general for the Gemini, you may not even get through uh like two plays of a card anyway so you could just use it for its bottom effect so there's that level five which we have a uh, formless greats and chitinous horde. So let's, as we've been doing, let's start with the melee form first. Formless greats, uh, heal to all allies that are adjacent to you, which is fine. A uh, formless grace and chitinous horde are another one of those mirrors where the top and bottom have another effect. So heal everything, heal all, all allies next to you, great. And then once during your turns, you can uh, suffer two damage to infuse fire or light. Keep in mind that you have to put this into play during your melee form, and fire is really only usable during your range form. So, but it's okay because you immediately swap to your range form and gain an experience. Being able to heal all your allies that are next to you is still pretty decent. And then for the rest of the scenario, it might be able to more reliably generate those elements to do those powerful attacks, especially for your range form, especially for like Dragonfly Surge. So this isn't bad, but the bottom is a jump four. Jump four on an ish 90, 75, which is pretty good. And potentially you can turn ice into ward self. Um, very good level five card. I think that no matter which way you, you lean on it, the, um, the top effect is going to be very good if you do want to more reliably use elements. Depends on if you have the ability to, you know, get through those that suffer two damage whenever you need an element. But the bottom at the very least is a jump four non-loss, which is still pretty strong. Kindness Horde on the other hand, um, 
the bottom being like grant an ally shield too, which is still pretty strong, but also if you have fire, you can strengthen them as well. Uh, it is a top though, so it's kind of like burning your top for almost you, uh, for a defensive effect, and it is initiative 15, which is a good undercut. Um, that's 15 is kind of like my threshold of where I like to cut off, although technically 14, but that's okay. But um, ultimately, this is something you can use to help an ally burst some damage out while also reducing their damage taken. Obviously, very leader effect indeed. The bottom is all adjacent enemies suffer two damage, which is great. Uh, it is on a loss, and it is. Uh, does swap you to melee form, but um, during once during each of your turns, you can have an ally. And allies suffer two damage, and if you do, you get ice or light, which is good for your melee form. Um, so this can be pretty strong if you do want to use some of those strong melee form effects. So strikers might want to pick up formless grace, formless grace, but it wouldn't be go bad to go back to pick up luminous descent for the jump five, infuse light stun. Um, anyway, because. Uh, you might need that, but Formless Grace at least allows you to um, just damage yourself to potentially get the ranged elements that you need to potentially blast maybe some more. Um, but uh, Striker probably goes for Formless Grace or Luminous Descent. I do think that obviously the um, the leader goes for Chitinous Horde. It's a very easy pick. That top ability is very um, helpful for that. But I think Controller can go for either. Uh, I think the jump and ward self is still pretty strong. The um, being able to um, generate whatever elements you need, I'd say lean whichever way you want. Um, probably controller might lead towards Chitinous Horde, but Formless Grace, obviously the jump four is super universal, and you do have some ice generation there, so uh, being able to jump four ward self is a way to get, get in the thick of things, take some hits, and um, potentially take some heat off of your friends as well, as well as giving, giving some good mobility. Level six. Uh, corrosive Acids versus Haruda Therapy. Corrosive Acid first. Attack two in a cone. In a, like a sweeping arc. A three, three arc. It's not a cone. It's a, a three hex cleave. It does have an enhancement dot for a fourth one. But yeah. But um, so you can brittle yourself to <laughs> brittle all the enemies in the area. It's a niche 28, so you don't want to like brittle yourself too early, but um, you could potentially put this with a late effect if you don't want to die. And you can impair yourself, which is hard to uh, pop um, all to use your, your amulet of life. But if you have like regenerate, you might be able to like snag all this off, but you can impair yourself to poison all the enemies in there. But watching enemies that have poison and brittle on them, they melt so fast. So. Uh, even though this is like an attack two, and then putting some nasty effects on them, just th having a good follow-up from your allies is huge here, because they might be able to just melt the enemies before they can even if, take the fact that you just brittled and impaired yourself on the spot. Um, I love this so much. This is this is like this is my favorite Gemini card, I think. But um, just being able to do that, just say, "Hey guys, jump on them and just watch them like melt these enemies that Urkus shatter them," because. I just usually say melt as a way to like just watch enemies fall over very quickly. Whole point is, is it's a good card. Um, oh yeah, it's got a bottom too, by the way. Um, move three and all enemies adjacent to you have... Alright, move three and all figures adjacent to you have two reduced shield this, this round. And then you swap to your range form at the end of it. Um, it does say figures. So it's not enemies, it's allies and enemies next to you. So... Um, uh, at the very least, if you do have some very annoying shielded enemies and you have like some weak attack ones or like, you know, changeling spoon where you're going to do an attack two, you can say like, hi, no, you're shielded, but boop, boop, I'm going to get through your annoying uh, shield with this. So that's pretty helpful. Move three, swap form, and potentially ignore shields. Still pretty strong on bottom. That's very un universally useful. Herd of Therapy, pick exactly two enemies at exactly range two or three and they suffer two damage then you heal self equal to the amount of damage they suffered now some people go if they're suffering damage yeah you can brittle them to potentially do more damage and heal more that's like one of the other effects of it but yeah they suffer two damage two damage and you heal equal to the amount of damage suffered so also if enemies are at one health you'll only heal one instead and then you swap to the melee form so it's potentially a way to draw like steal life you heal yourself which is still strong and you can potentially finish off weak enemies or like 
I, I wouldn't drop a suffer two damage on a brittled enemy. I'd wait for an enemy, like an ally, to actually punch through them. But you can effectively leech, reliably leech off anything that has low health and just. Because one of the worst things is like, oh, that guy's at two health, don't worry, and then draw like a negative two or something. And I know I always like to filter out the negative two because that's me, but yeah. Anyway, the bottom, the initiative 92 is really good because you need some late initiatives and you frankly don't have a lot. But the bottom, on the other hand, is a move three, attack two at range. So you, it's not only that, move three, attack two at range. So you can like move out and attack. But attack two at range three, four is still pretty strong. But you can immobilize yourself to... Um, add immobilize to this range to mobilize is great you can curse yourself to target two enemies with this the, i wouldn't say the curse yourself is even remotely worth it to just do a, a, a to do two attack twos i mean it probably is but to do two attack two immobilizes yes so if you do need to immobilize them this is one easy way to non-loss hard crowd control to get some other attacks out so uh, notice that this level is very interesting because this is the only level where there are no loss effects on either side controllers are obviously going to take her to therapy the um immobilization at range especially multi-targets just too good to pass up and corrosive acids is obviously going to be picked up by the strikers and i think the leader can go either way but probably towards her to therapy although again i don't think that the, the the leader honestly the leader probably should take corrosive acids if only the fact that they can hit enemies and follow have allies follow up on it so it's a very good enabling thing to make your allies attack better so i can see either way though but um it's mostly up to you a striker obviously takes corrosive acids and use it as often as possible because <laughs> it's so good uh, level seven two-pronged entrapment or alluring pheromones pheromones wonderful thought two-pronged entrapment is um so attack for first up initiative 21 is pretty strong i would for a shield effect but you know it's got the other things baked into it but um i prefer it to be a little bit earlier but attack four shield oneself which is already pretty strong as is um not for necessarily for a level seven card but then you can turn any element to get ice and light keep in mind now you're in melee form and you don't swap on this so ice and light is what you need for your melee form so this is one thing you can do to turn any element at all into the two elements you need for your melee form not only that but putting an okay attack in and shielding yourself it's a pretty decent card um the attack on bottom though is <laughs> um you, you you pick this little weird formation and then push to and brittle all the enemies of the formation which is we love that uh -huh. but um also if you have ice available after the push they're immobilized and if you have light available uh they get to get um disarmed so this is one way to just toss all of the negative effects on the thing you need obviously ice and light and you're like hey it would be really cool if i had both congratulations the top of this gives you both it's hard to i mean what are you gonna do you could just short rest after like doing the top and then use the bottom it's it's, it's doable but um uh the funny part is the top of one's a good generator the bottom one's a good spender so it balances itself pretty well. But being able to like multi-target potential, even with light, just disarm and brittle, just screws over enemies entirely. Alluring pheromones, on the other hand, is attack three in this strange kind of weird formation of semi-line. Um, and it pulls them for two. But attack three on all of them of pull two is perfectly fine. It's kind of like into my embrace plus plus. Um, but this one doesn't have the um, synergy of swapping to the melee form after. However, it does have the synergy of um, consume an element and create fire and light, obviously as a mirror to um, two-pronged entrapment. So um, the problem is, um, if, with the pulls on this um, and staying in ranged form, they might be too close now, so it might just be some attacks, attack threes, that then eventually pulls into uh, fire and light, which is fine. On the other hand, um, the bottom of this is kind of like the, again, the opposite of, which I, I love the bottom of this anyway, is you create a, a bless regen wave targeting all your friends in the area. Um, but if you have fire, you also strengthen them, which is great. And if you light, have light, you bless them twice instead of once. Um, this is really great if you have a bow shape where you're just going to like shower the whole field in um blesses you're gonna shuffle all the blesses into their deck 
And they're going to be like, thank you so much. So Striker goes for two-pronged entrapment, um, but I could see you going for Alluring Pheromones if you wanted to AoE more, but probably goes for, I, I'd lean for two-pronged entrapment. And so does Controller. Controller just for that bottom, that's too many debuffs to pick. Leader goes for Alluring Pheromones regardless because that big bottom, uh, the bottom of that is too profoundly powerful as a support action for it to turn down. Plus, at the very least, the top action gives you a good amount of AoE as is, which no matter what build you are, it's never going to turn that down. Level 8, we have Accelerated Metabolism versus Oscillating Entity. And both of these are another mirror effect. So again, with the melee, you can fire or ice, and this is the only fire spender in the melee form. Uh, and coincidentally, the other card is the only fire spender in the ice, uh, the only ice spender in the ranged form. But you can strengthen yourself, which is, that's, that's good to start off that way. And then you can attack three targeting two adjacent enemies with pierce three i know retaliate's pretty annoying for this but like even then just being able to attack three pierce three um you can melt those super annoying enemies especially strengthen built in you can melt those super annoying enemies like sh living spirits and flame demons this is the go-to card for that which is great the initiative 85's Good enough to go late, but not sure I like an attack on it, but you could at least jump in, use this to melt enemies after the effect. The bottom is a nice loss effect. Move six, move six built in on a loss. Move six, and then you at the end of your turn, you swap to ranged form. But here's the thing. Now, now move six and swap to ranged form is not a very good um, like level eight loss, but then it allows you to um, kind of like ring of haste, <laughs> or ring of power, ring of brutality getting my items mixed up um i guess it could be ring of haste the whole point is this you pick a card in your hand from the melee form although i know you're in ranged form when this happens you can now use the range form the cool part this sets up like really cool effects for like uh the melee form for cards that you wanted to use while in melee form that are while in range form but couldn't and this kind of enables that but i preferably like for an oscillating entity which we'll get into two seconds, the reason why this could, the opposite could potentially be better. But this gets you into position and you can potentially use a melee action on the uh, from this, and then you lose this card. So um, you don't lose the card you played unless it's a loss, but anyway. Uh, Oscillating Entity, on the other hand, is a attack four, but you can only target enemies that are range two or three away. And then at the start, you lose it, but uh, you switch to melee form, but then you can play one card from your range form. The cool part about this is, is this is one way to cool set up like a uh, dragonfly surge while in <laughs> uh, while in this form. So you can say like, hey, I'm gonna play dragonfly surge, the bottom of it. I'm gonna poison myself, but I have a t advantage in Pierce two on all my attacks this turn. Then use venomous barbs. So it's an, it's now an attack two poison Pierce two with advantage, and then thresh and flail on top. Just <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> Super good. Um, that's one way to burst out damage. Personally, I think Oscillating Entity is the way to go there. The bottom is, at the very least, move four, bless self. But if you have Ice or Fire, you strengthen yourself as well. I think it's a... Which is really strong. That's a good bottom. Initiative 55 sucks, though. <laughs> Personally, it depends on like what kind of combos you want to go for. But uh, I think either of them can be useful. I do think the AoE on both of them can be used. Like, the, the melee AoE with Pierce is still pretty strong. The ability to lose a card and be able to play one of your range cards instantly into uh, the melee form is great. Obviously, the combo of uh, like Dragonfly Surge on the using Oscillating Entity is still pretty strong. So it really depends on what your build's going for. I lean towards Oscillating Entity myself, but there's really no wrong pick here. But if you're confused, go Oscillating Entity because I'm never wrong. Level nine, we're finally here. We have Harbinger of Ruin and Voice of Salvation. Harbinger of Ruin gives us a delicious initiative 11 though, so that's pretty cool. Harbinger of Ruin is kind of like the ultimate, like almost tanky thing on the next four sources of melee attacks targeting you. So you have to be hit, take a melee. Um, you gain um, Ward, which can reduce the damage in half, and then the attacking enemy suffers five damage. So it's a loss, but they say five damage, five damage. Like you can really burst out damage while also reducing your incoming damage by giving yourself four wards over four attacks. That's a significant, it's literally having like the damage you take over your next four attacks on you, which is great. And it's bouncing up to 20 damage back to enemies. Um, that's solid. 
The bottom, on the other hand, is a nice attack for immobilize and retaliate too. Retaliate too is obviously really good on the um, 11 initiative, um, but immobilize and retaliate are not necessarily super productive. But you could potentially immobilize a ranged enemy and then force them to attack you at melee with disadvantage, and then take the retaliate, which is pretty strong. This reminds me of the um, Harrower enemies with like all their like sources of you know retaliate and um, immobilize. So it's this kind of feels like you're channeling your inner harrower and fester here so um still pretty deep that's a that's a good level nine bottom but um it's not like overwhelmingly strong but it's still pretty i mean level attack for mobilizing bottoms really hard to complain about though so there's that voice of salvation on the other hand initiative 39 is garbage but um all allies within range three add plus two on all their attacks and all enemies have minus one on all their attacks now, this only lasts for one round, but giving allies plus two to all of their attacks and enemies minus one to all theirs is such a big swing that this can pay off in significant amounts. And the bottom, the bottom's so interesting. So you lose a card and it's effectively going to replace four cards, but the next four times that an ally would elect to say, I'm going to lose a card to prevent the damage, they don't lose any card instead. They just don't lose a card. You basically can block the next four sources of damage, which is a huge amount of damage prevention. It is indeed the voice of salvation, chittering, scritchy, blah. Yeah, level nine's pretty, pretty, pretty fun as is, but um, leaders obviously go for voice of salvation. Strikers go for harbinger of ruin, and I do think controllers probably also go for harbinger of ruin. But I could see you picking voice of salvation for the, um, the other, for the. Um, uh, the debuffing enemies with minus one and helping your allies. But I think Harbinger of Ruin is just a little bit easier to use in that regard, but Voice of Salvation is really good bailing out your allies. It's harder to lose a scenario when you can get four gimme, uh, lose a card to, uh, to damage to help buffer your guys. All right, so it's perk time. So the very easy things, get that minus one, or get rid of the minus two, replace it with a plus zero. I'm going to be honest, there's a lot of, like, you have a lot of, you don't have a lot of those big attacks. Like, you have Icebound Quills and Dragonfly Surge, but, um, and Dragonfly Surge you could potentially advantage your way out of. But you have a lot of, like, attack ones in a group, attack twos in a group, and some attack threes. That the minus two basically could be the equivalent of nulls. So get that out of there. Get it out of there. Um, but then you can replace the minus ones that can, uh, replace the minus ones with plus zeros that also turn whatever element into what you need. You can kind of use this to set up, you have a lot of element spenders that you might, that are a little bit wild, um, that, that you could potentially say, oh, well, I accidentally created fire, ice, or light, and then change your next turn based off of something you drew. Um, it's a little bit more reliable for your class than other classes, but, um, yeah, I'd say so. But also, e even after you get that, replacing the zeros with poisons or wounds with plus ones are also still pretty strong effects, as well as ignoring scenario effects, because the scenario effects in Frosthaven are a little bit more rapid. They tend to be not as bad as the Gloomhaven scenario effects, but they're like twice as often. So like, you're gonna be protecting yourself notably. Like, it's less randomly. It's definitely less swingy, but it's worth picking. Also, amidst all these replacements, there is that add one crit in there with a brittle built in. Yeah, brittle self. Uh, totally pick it. It's too fun not to pick. And not only that, but adding another crit to your deck actually does... It does a lot for your damage. And I know, and you have a little bit more control over the losing the brittle self. And speaking of, the um, once per scenario when you give yourself a negative condition, prevent that condition take that because you have a couple cards that can like disarm or curse yourself in the worst situations or muddle yourself where you want to like uh, give yourself advantage like disadvantage on a multi-attack you can potentially like turn off the effects once per scenario and it's only one check so usually when you do like have these cards um over the course of scenario at the rate you draw usually you'll only trigger them once a scenario anyway so a lot of value only ends up being like worth two overall but um, I think in general, this is this can pay off way more than two if you like, hey, I'm not disarming myself on my Venomous Barbs so I can follow up on the next turn. Hey, I just drew that crit, but I don't want to brittle myself because I'm about to get like slapped, so on and so forth. But um, I, I, I personally think that, that those two are very easily to pick, very easy to pick ones. But I think after that, you just kind of want to like smooth out your deck. I, I As much as I want to replace the two like plus zero with rolling pierces, um, it just makes the deck more consistent and it ends up 
<clears throat> and the rolling pierces are harder to use. But that's definitely something that's worth worthwhile after you've replaced like some of the more other zeros with like plus one wounds or plus one poisons and that get the other times two in there. The um, cleanse, like the, and the remove a diva from an ally on short rest. I just, not a fan of that at all. Something on items so, though, um, you, you're going to want to pick, since you have the ability to debuff yourself a lot with all these, you're going to come up with what ways to either remove effects or prevent conditions from landing. So um, like you have a shield that can, uh, you have shields that can p potentially prevent uh, conditions from landing. You have amulet of life that can clear all the poison wound and muddle you do. You have other effects that you can use to get advantage. Uh, if you have ways to get strength in, uh, do that as well. There is a potion that can do it later. We're, we're not going to spoil how to unlock it, but um, th this kind of is a way to like counteract muddle or other other effects that you can use to mitigate. Because if you Put the the debuff self stuff is usually like ahead of the curve like there's no condition you're just going to attack for disarm which is too good of a level one card but you have some drawbacks there so just tap amulet of life and undo it like that's that's very strong so being able to undo the effects of the powerful things that give you negative conditions is probably the way to go for in terms of items as well as the fact that you're probably going to be suffering some damage in the way so you're going to want to bring some self healing anyway or giving enemies disadvantage also, if you have the ability to more reliably generate stuff with like elements, consider that as well. That's going to get you a lot more experience and a lot more effect if you can more reliably get the elements you need without like having to burn those losses. So for the Geminit, what you want, kind of want to do is, even as you like develop and pick cards that you level up, you want to have a certain amount of uh, form swaps, you want to have a certain amount of element generators or the ability to use them if you're going to. Uh, as well as some spenders. We have plenty of spenders. You don't need to like worry about bringing them. It doesn't matter which cards you bring. You're gonna be bringing spenders anyway. But you, if you want, you'll want some reliable way to get the elements you want, which may end up being something like Changeling's Boon or later levels. You'll be able to do that, or bring the items that you need to get the elements that you need. Um, but um, the general strategy is to being able to play those losses at early impact. This is why, like, I know in like some other classes, I've been kind of like down on like. Um, high level losses like congratulations you lose this like instantly like is it even worth it and like a lot of times I'm going to be leaning more into the higher effects of that but because your hand size and rest cycle you're not going to be able to like play the high level cards necessarily as often so that's why like for like luminous descent jump five stun two enemies give yourself the element you need is not something I like frown down on because honestly being able to like turn a rune into like hey I'm into position I'm stunning these guys and getting an element to set up a thing can potentially be a good enough action as is um, even though like I know it's not necessarily 100% the way it is but sometimes over the course of a scenario you may play a card only once uh, especially because like you have 14 cards um, you're gonna play six play six and then um, you're gonna like have two left over uh, potentially those leftover cards don't necessarily need to be the greatest things in the world or they could be very conditional that you're holding on to it for a specific purpose so um, Food for thought there but in general um bring enough uh, form swapping that you'll be able to bail yourself out at the case you where you uh, keep going also the form swapping just basically never hurts to have enough of that in as is and of course um get the negative perks out of the way because you have a lot of like weak number attacks that just add up over time so don't kill yourself on retaliate <laughs> just like melt, melt the little enemies, brittle them, and have fun with corrosive acid. So I do hope this guide was helpful. I do think that Gemini has a lot going on. So, um, but there's like a lot of freedom in, in it. So if it wasn't obvious from the way I've talked about like which build to pick what, you have a lot of freedom in terms of which cards to pick, but which ones to use in specific order, I think is um, vitally important and ways to mitigate the effects of that. Like ways to like oh no i'm riddling myself and whatnot like that there's a lot of potential drawbacks but there's ways to either mitigate those effects or being able to pair those into other fun combos like you know 
um, door kicking with them into my embrace, for example, is another very viable strategy. So um, if you have some of your own um, Gemini strategies or fun stuff that you did, especially with um, some of those cards, the, the two cards that allow you to play stuff from other form, let us know in the comments. I'd love to hear it. Um, so as per usual, though, if you've gotten this far in the video, please hit like. It uh, really helps the channel. If you really want to support us, consider joining Patreon. Um, speaking of patrons, thank you to our Inox tier patrons. I really appreciate everything you do. We're going to be putting another poll up. Actually, I think I'm going to take the second result. I'm taking the second result of the uh, poll, but we'll, um, I'll, I'll do updates to make sure you have access to the next guide early as well. And um, we'll take another idea on what the, I mean, like, uh, thank you to patrons for suggesting the Masteries video idea. If you have other ideas, I'm going to be asking you as well to see which suggestions you have, and we'll put that, turn that into a video for you guys. So thank you so much, patrons, and thanks all of you for watching.